Let's begin then. Uh, I'm Timothy Endicott. I'm delighted to um, be part of this and to, to have the opportunity to learn about what's going on in Poland uh, with the perspective of, in this session, of two uh, leaders in the Polish universities in uh, political and legal theory and in the study of law. Um, Tomasz Gisbert Studnicki has been the head of uh, legal philosophy at the Jagiellonian University, and Professor Lech Morawski, Professor Lech Morawski head, of the Department head of the Department of Theory and Law at the Nicholas Copernicus University and the Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw. I understand that, I think Tomasz will speak first, and the two speakers will speak for 20 or 25 minutes. And I propose that you hold on to questions until the end of the two talks, and then we will um, have an opportunity for question and answer before we conclude this session at uh, 10 minutes to 1, very promptly. And then there'll be further discussion in the afternoon session with the commentators from Oxford responding to what we are learning about, uh, about law and the role of judges in Poland. Tomasz. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. That's a privilege honor to be here in the capital of world legal philosophy. So I'm really proud of this. That maybe for that reason I will be slightly more specific than the people who, of the speakers were first father. I prepared a text that I sent to organizers some time ago. I'm not going to repeat this text, I will only pick up one issue and then I will continue developing certain ideas proposed by Professor Marcin Matczak. This written text contains the analysis of one of the judgments of the Constitutional Court, already mentioned by Professor Matczak, Matczak that is a judgment of uh, 9 of March uh, 2016. Uh, that is not a very tight analysis. I got a limit of 2,500 words, and the first draft of my paper was about 15,000 words. <laughs> uh, I had to make a dramatic cut of that, what I had to try to present. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk about this uh, judgment of 9th of March, and then uh, and I deal with the following issue. Uh, in the proceedings leading to this judgment, the tribunal, the tribunal decided not to apply certain provisions of uh, the statute amending the mode of proceeding before the tribunal, so-called amending statute. And this amending statute was a subject matter of the Constitution. Uh, in particular, the tribunal um, decided not to apply the rules relating to the composition of the panel of judges, required majority and mandatory sequence of the cases to be considered. The opponents of the tribunal argue that the tribunal had no right to ignore those provisions as the tribunal is bound by the presumption of constitutionality, what means that uh, statutory rule is deemed to be valid as long as its unconstitutionality has not been declared by the tribunal. Um, so I argue that the the approach of the tribunal was the only way to avoid the logical paradox, which is very similar. Put it briefly, uh, don't be afraid, I will have only four or five slides. So, uh, this paradox is explained here, here. Namely, the opponents of the uh, judgment agree as follows. The judgment is wrong because it has not been based on the relevant rule, uh, rules of the amending statute. However, uh, what would happen if, had the tri tribunal applied the statut statutory rules which were the subject matter of the review, uh, but the word had remained the same, declaration of unconstitutionality. Obviously, the award would be incorrect because it had 
it had been based on unconstitutional statutory rules. Therefore, uh, as I explained here on this slide, in the eyes of the opponents of the tribunal, the outcome is exact, exactly the same. Had the tribunal applied the rules, the, the judgment would have been wrong because it was based on unconstitutional rules. Had the tribunal not applied the rules, the award would have been wrong because it was not based on statutory rules. Uh, to my mind, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, paradoxical. Uh, in the written presentation, I argue, however, with some hesitation that the, 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 the reasoning applied by the tribunal is a standard, although sophisticated, legal reasoning. Therefore, for the purpose of justification of the judgment, there's no need to refer to such concepts uh, as self-defense of the tribunal or the state of constitutional uh, emergency. Uh, it's, it's clear that, uh, that self-defense or state of emergency uh, or, or, or necessity uh, involve a breach of certain legal rules for the purpose of defending more fundamental rules of principle, principles. <coughs> uh, therefore, irrespective of how we define uh, self-defense of constitutional necessity, um, the justification of the thesis that the tribunal acted in self defense uh, requires additional argumentative effort, and such argumentation must refer to such concept as health of the uh, constitutional orders, immediate danger, and so on and so on, which are essentially, probably essentially contested concepts, and if not essentially contest contested, then certainly at least contested concepts. Uh, in my today's uh, presentation, I'm not going to repeat my analysis in the written text. Instead of that, I'm going to discuss uh, the certain more general issues. Uh, let me assume for the purpose of the discussion that my analysis is sound, and uh, in particular, the tribunal had to ignore certain rules of the amending statute, as otherwise a logical paradox uh, would arise. But the question arises, is the intention to avoid a logical paradox a sufficient uh, justification for refusal to apply certain statutory rules? Let me quote Peter Sober as a text of 1990. He writes, the principle that's logical, uh, that what is logically impossible must be legally impossible, may be philosophically uh, arrogant or ignorant of legal history. But it's not a single mistake, it is a new variation of the theme of natural law. Instead of finding that human law depends for its validity on an eternal moral law, this version makes it dependent on the internal logical law. If human law can be immoral without ceasing to be law, it, it seems it can be illogical without ceasing to be law. Law has its own test of what is law, and those tests validate, validate much of that uh, the, uh, is immoral or illogical. Uh, the question is whether this <coughs> statement of Sober is right. Let me assume for the purpose of discussion that, that we are all legal positivists and we endorse the social sources thesis. That is, we believe that what is law is fully determined by social facts alone. Can we, notwithstanding the social social thesis, argue that a decision or a regulation contradicting the laws of logic cannot be legal? Is logical rationality a necessary presumption of law? What are we to do if a statute contains two contradictory rules? P is obligatory and P is prohibited. Are uh, both of uh, those rules valid law? Of course, I do not have a full answer to this question. Uh, I would like only to underline a fundamental difference between eternal natural law, if one believes in its existence, and the laws of logic. The content of natural law is always controversial. Even if we are moral realists, uh, I'm not a moral realist, uh, we must admit that we have limited cognitive access to moral facts. 
the content of fundamental logical laws, such as principle of contradiction, law that excluded middle or modus ponens, is not controversial. If we admit two contradictory rules in the normative system, any conceivable logical conclusion will follow according to the logical law. P and don't P uh, implies Q. That would mean that uh, it could be demonstrated that anything law, we can as well demonstrate that anything is illegal, so we have no law at all. Uh, of course, uh, I do not wish to argue that uh, uh, on the such legal reasoning is sound visage based uh, the, on logical laws uh, in which the conclu conclusion logically follows from the premises. Lawyers uh, use uh, various modes of reasoning, including abductive, inductive reasoning. But <coughs> that does not mean that we are free to ignore basic logical laws, as in the, uh, at, in the first place we are not able to ignore the principle of contradiction. If we uh, uh, reject the principle of contradiction, any uh, conclusion may, may be justified. But if I'm wrong in, in my analysis of the judgment of 9th of March 2016, that means that no logical paradox of self-reference would be triggered had the tribunal applied the challenge rules of the amending statute, of, or if my general view on the relationship between law and logic is mistaken, the only way of defending the award is to refer to the concept of self-defense or constitutional necessity. Um, before I come to those issues, one clarification is necessary, and namely this is a clarification relating to the purpose of the amending law. Uh, the, amending, uh, uh, the, the amending statute. The amending statute provided for the panel of 13 judges and for supermajority. Uh, those regulations made it impossible for the tribunal to act, as in that time there were only 12 judges whose mandates were unchallenged, and gave the newly elected judges the blocking minority. In addition, the obligation to consider the cases in sequence of the filing with the tribunal um, uh, would uh, cause that, uh, uh, would postpone the judgment with, resp with respect to the constitutionality of the amending statute for several years. In the meantime, any judgment of the tribunal would be based on regulations, the constitutionality of which uh, has been challenged. Therefore, it seems to me quite clear that the political purpose of the amending statutes uh, was as such, to give the newly elected judges full control of the tribunal, or, uh, or at least to paralyze the activity of the tribunal. Uh, Professor Matchak, in his paper presented the first session, the session uh, developed the idea of self-defense in analogy to the concept of self-defense as used in the criminal law, uh, the, as the right basis for justification of the actions of the tribunal. I would like to say a few words about an alternative route of justification, and namely by reference to the concept of necessity, also by analogy to the criminal law. The first question that arises in this context, I think that uh, this question was raised already in the first session, is whether um, the concept of self-defense, the concept of necessity, uh, are specific uh, legal concepts having application only in certain selected spheres of law, such as criminal law, or are general legal concepts which may find application of, of, uh, uh, also in other areas of law? Um, that is a difficult question. As far as uh, state of necessity is concerned, this concept, this under Polish law, finds application not only in criminal law, but also in civil law and administrative law. There is no explicit reference to the state of necessity in constitutional law, but I do not see any fundamental uh, obstacles against uh, an attempt uh, of application of this 
concept, the constitutional law as well. I see one uh, important advantage of the use of the concept of necessity if this route is feasible. Namely, the application of the concept of self-defense uh, uh, implies that the tribunal is defending, defending itself. Uh, that means that the uh, actions of the tribunal are in a sense egoistic. This presupposition is absent if we apply the concept of necessity. If the argumentation making use of the concept of necessity is successful, this would mean that the tribunal is not, is not just defending itself, but rather some fundamental values of the constitutional order. Obviously, uh, the requirements that must be met in order to, to, to apply this concept are different than the requirements for the use of the concept of self-defense. Let me uh, use the analogy to criminal law. Uh, uh, the criminal, uh, Polish criminal code defines the uh, uh, state of necessity in the following way. Whoever acts for the purpose of averting an immediate dan danger threatening any interest or good protected by law, if the danger cannot otherwise be avoided, but the interest of good sacrificed has a lower value uh, than the debt of the interest good, good rescued, he shall be deemed to have not committed an offense. Uh, therefore, uh, the necessity so understood makes an action which is prima facie illegal, it makes such action illegal. But necessity involves a breach of certain legal rules for the purpose of the protection of certain other, more fundamental rules of principles. If we use the analogy to the criminal law, we need to demonstrate that the following requirements are, are met. First, the good or value protected by the tribunal and the good uh, or value sac sacrificed by the uh, tribunal must be identified. Second, the value protected must be higher than the value sacrificed. Third, the value protected must be immediate danger. And uh, fourth, such danger cannot be otherwise avoided. So it's clear that quite a lot of argumentative effort must be used in order to uh, justify that all those uh, requirements are met. I'm not able to develop such uh, argumentation fully, so just let me uh, say a few words. First, identification of values and their hierarchy. Uh, as I think, two uh, values are here involved. The first value is the, sub is the supremacy of the Constitution. That is the protected value. And the second value, the sacrificed value, is fidelity to statutory rules. Both values are formal in that they do not depend on the content of the Constitution and on the content of the statutory rules. But there is no doubt that due to the uh, position of the Constitution uh, in the legal system, the protected value, that is a value of the uh, supremacy of the Constitution, is higher than the sacrifice value, that is the value of fidelity to the state. So that's the first premise. The second premise is immediate danger. Uh, it must be demonstrated that the value protected is an immediate danger. Uh, as I think, uh, the very fact that fidelity to the statutory rules of the amending statute makes effective functioning of the tribunal, uh, tribunal impossible justifies the conclusion that the position of the tribunal as the guardian of the constitution is in immediate danger, as the tribunal, tribunal is the only guardian of the supremacy of the constitutional rule. This means that uh, 
uh, also the tribunal defends its position, the underlying, the underlying value protected by the tribunal is the supremacy of the Constitution, and not just the position of the tribunal. Position of the tribunal is a sort of instrumental value with respect to the value of supremacy, sub supremacy of the Constitution. And third, it must be uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, the uh, danger, uh, there's no other way uh, of uh, protection possible. In the existing political circumstances, no other institution in our legal system can protect the supremacy of the Constitution. Let me recall you that, uh, as Professor Manchak explained, the amending st statute became effective immediately upon publication, so that was no vacatio legis uh, period, what is, uh, that is very unusual. That is not a clear breach of the Constitution, but anyhow, it's a very unusual in the practice of our legislation. In that way, the Parliament made impossible the judicial review of the amending statute before its effective day. The President signed the amending statute almost immediately and did not use his power to, in, to initiate the judicial review before signing. That is a clear evidence that the intention of the uh, parliament and the president was to make the judicial review impossible. So that is why, to my mind, the, uh, the, the false uh, requirement of the state of constitutional necessity uh, has been satisfied as, uh, as well. The, as I said before, uh, the defense of the award of, uh, uh, by application of the concept of constitutional necessity requires quite a lot of argumentative efforts. Uh, I have been able only to sketch the outline of the argumentation, uh, but a lot of work has still to be done. Just to conclude, um, the, under Polish law, uh, a judgment of the Constitutional Court becomes effective upon publication in the Journal of Laws. Uh, the Journal of Laws is administered by the Council of Ministers. Uh, that was a common practice that was absolutely uncontro uncontroversial until the last elections that that was on the administrative matter. The president of the tribunal was sending the a judgment to the to the office of the prime minister and, and all judgments used to be to be to be published. In this particular case the government refused to publish the the, the judgment. Um, Irrespective of that, whether judgment is right or wrong, uh, that is a clear breach of the principle of divide of powers. So that's uh, uh, the, the government uh, is a, uh, acted as it had a power to review the judgments of the constitu uh, constitutional court. Uh, this. Um, breach of the divide of power is clear and uh, that's the breach irrespective whether somebody believes that the judgment was, or is, uh, is right or wrong. The government tends to think that we'll publish only such judgments which in our opinion are right. We refuse to publish uh, all judgments which in our opinions are wrong. Uh, so I would like to conclude with this simple statement. Thank you very much for your attention. I've always thought that the publishers of the law reports are extraordinarily powerful people. And perhaps it's a general principle that they should use their power without passing judgment on <laughs> the correctness of the decisions of the courts. Perhaps that's a general principle as well as a constitutional principle. But we can come back to that and to many other things in Professor Studnitsky's talk. But first, Professor Morasti, please go ahead. So thank you uh, very much for the invitation. Please forgive me my bad language, goggle bad language, but I will be trying to present the position of uh, 
so criticize government and its opinions, yes? Let me begin by quoting Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address, in which he stated that a democratic government should be government of the people, by the people, and for the people. As you know, the current government in Poland does not enjoy the support of so-called enlightened elites, that is, political and economic establishment, and it does not support it by majority of Polish academics, professor. Uh, professor, but it is supported by the majority of ordinary people. Let me remember now the book of Ronald uh, Dworkin, Is Democracy Possible Here? That is in the USA, in America. Ronald Dworkin mentions two political camps in the USA. The Red Camp, people associated with small towns, rural areas, farmers, and apart from this, people attached to very, sometimes very, really conservative values, yes. And the so-called the blue camp, referring to residents of large cities, businessmen, in so-called intellectuals, and so on and so on. Now, if we substitute the term the Red Camp, with the supporters of Law and Justice Party, whereas the term the Blue Camp, with the supporters of the Civic Platform Party, you will get an image or a picture of what is happening in my country. Thus, similarly to the situation, to the conflict in the, in the US, the conflict in Poland, in my opinion, is primarily political conflict. It cannot be, and will be not, never resolved by means of legal arguments, in, partic in particular by means of legal tricks, yes, um, uh, based on very, very sophisticated interpretation of politics of Polish law. It can be resolved only by means of, as my colleague said, by means of political debates. Yes. But of course, I cannot negate the fact that this political conflict has serious political, social, economic, and legal consequences. One of these important legal consequences refers to the status of constitutional tribunal, and second, to the way of interpreting the Polish constitution. Because, especially Professor Marczak argumented so, as, as he possessed that sacred power to discover the only true meaning of Polish constitution. That is, in my, in my eyes, from the semantic point of view, an absurd. It's an absurd, because Polish constitution is very, very open textured. Yes. But we say about this a bit later. Now, few words, uh, a few words about two different visions of uh, the Constitutional Tribune. The Polish uh, government and parliament defends the doctrine of judicial restraint, or judicial passivism, conservatism, based on the following principle. The law should be as strict as possible, as precise as possible. The Constitutional Tribunal 
may not create or change the law. And the third, judges should not engage in political activity. The opposition, gathered mainly around civic platform party, contrary to official rhetoric, because it is uh, always a rhetoric in the spirit of judicial restraint, yes, propose a program of hard judicial activism, strong hard judicial activism. What do I mean by, the, the, by this? The laws must be due to the opposition adapted or adjusted to changing circumstances, in particular to the requirements of EU and Council of Europe. The Constitution must be therefore, must be therefore be interpreted as a living instrument, as a living constitution. For this reason, if necessary, the city constitutional tribunal organ can correct the content of existing rules on even on, or uh, even create new ones. For in constitutional matters, the city has the final and unquestionable say. Yes. The decision, according to this point of view, even if contrary to the logic, contrary to the law, cannot be questioned. Because, why? Because the, 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 these are the decision of a constitutional tribunal. No? Very, very sophisticated, I would say, justification. And the third, judges should not engage in political activity. I must admit. It is, of course, very, very doubtful whether both sides, no one, but both sides fulfill, fulfill postulate of political neutrality. Yes. But second, we need to complete this descript description with a brief but very um, important comment. The Polish constitution is extremely ambiguous and unclear. It's typical constitution of a welfare state based on the German constitution of uh, 1939. But contrary to the German constitution, uh, it is far more ambiguous and unprecise, full of uh, pretensions, proclamations, declarations, which have no legal meaning or which have, um, which can be interpreted in practically in every way, in every way. You can find any meaning and put it in, in the text Polish Constitution. It is a legislative, in my opinion, it is a legislative tragedy. Tragedy. It is a legislative drama. For this reason, since yes, many people say that without uh, correcting Polish constitution, we come to no consensus. We can no consensus because the power is in the hands of opposition. It, uh, it interprets another way. It, it is uh, in the power of the party law and justice. It interprets it in quite contrary way, yeah? and all this meaning can be put uh, in the text of the Constitution. Yes. But now the most, more important questions. Two different interpretations of the Polish Constitution and the law. <coughs> Shortly speak, the opposition defends a liberal way of interpreting um, the Polish Constitution, whereas the current government favors the Republican one. As you well know, the, gov the Polish government is constantly, current uh, of course, governments constantly uh, accused of violent basic standards of liberal state. But in my eyes, this accusation is simply, is simply ridiculous. Unfortunately, many people 
in my country and abroad believe it in this uh, accusation. For this reason, in order to avoid a misunderstanding, I propose to distinguish two different meanings of the term democratic and liberal state. First, in the first meaning of the term, the term democratic and liberal uh, state embraces all state accepting most basic constitutional fundamentals, such as the separation of powers, basic human rights, the rule of law, and so on and so on. See, uh, uh, with regards to this fundamentals to the article, t uh, article 2 of the T on Europe, t, uh, Treaty on the European Union, yes? This definition of liberal state applies to some different states as a conservative state, social democratic state, republican, republican states, and finally strictly liberal states and their different forms. In the second meaning, a term a liberal state refers only to strictly, as I say, pure or orthodox liberal states. That is, to the states which political system is based on the individualistic concept of rights, as a trump cards in language of Dworkin, uh, against community, with no acceptance of any collective rights, yes, and secondly, which political system, economic system, is entirely based on the Weberian criteria of economic rationality, such as profit maximization and economic efficiency. See famous uh, Leszek Balcerowicz, uh, uh, reference, yes? If he, we grasp in this way the conflict between two opposition and the current government, we see that that, that is a conflict be, between the adherence of the pure liberal orthodox state and adherence of the Republican way of interpreting Polish Constitution. So basically, the current government does not undermine or negate the, these fu uh, constitutional fundamentals uh, like uh, 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 the separation of powers, uh, the rule of law, and so on. <coughs> So, I uh, would like now to say a few words about Polish tradition. In my opinion, the government and supporters uh, rightly argue that the strictly liberal model uh, of the state and the constitution is uh, completely incompatible with the Polish tradition and constitutional identity. It should be strongly emphasized that Polish constitutionalism from the very beginning, starting from the first Polish constitution of the fact of May uh, uh, 1791, which uh, introduced in Europe as one of the first the separation of, of power, the rule of law, and so on and so on, was modeled on, on, uh, 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 on the basis of American constitution and the French Declaration of Human Rights. To the last constitution, uh, ending, and the last constitution, current constitution, has been not based on strictly liberal values, but on republican ones. What does it mean? I uh, try to explain a bit later. In this context, I should discuss the accusation made by the EU, the Council of Europe, members of Venice Commission 
and the Polish, that the Polish government violates the European and international standard of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. In my opinion, the Venice Commission and other institutions clearly misinterpret the standards of the rule of law, which result from the European Convention on Human Rights and the EU treaties. In particular, they, they misinterpret Article uh, 4, Section 2 of the T on EU, according to which the European Union shall respect the national identity of the member states and their basic political and constitutional structure. The attitude of EU leaders contradicts also the fundamental principle of the EU uh, uh, law and its famous motto, United in diversity. It substitutes its primarily by the motto United in unity. We all must be uh, orthodox liberal in order to follow um, the, the structures of the democratic liberal states. We negate such a, uh, so I would, uh, such a position. It's uh, Obviously, the Republican tradition uh, uh, is vivid not only in Poland, not only on, on, in Hungary, but is vivid in many other countries in the world. Let's mention on, only, in my opinion at least, the USA, the Great Britain, for example, writings by uh, Michael Sandel, uh, McIntyre writings uh, of representatives of uh, Cambridge Historical School, Phil Petit, Quentin Skinner, and many others, with Hannah Arendt also. But let's notice that even the greatest, in my opinion, of course, liberal uh, today's uh, current uh, Republican uh, philosophers like John Rawls and Jürgen Habermas agree that liberal institutions require Republican correction. Like require, it should be, uh, should be emphasized that the, uh, um, so I would say, we honor, we respect, of course, this uh, basic uh, constitutional fundamentals. But apart from this, and it is a thorn in the eyes of the liberals, of orthodox liberals, right? we are attached deeply to strictly conservative uh, republican values. It is a part of our constitutional identity. We, we are, we are very deep connected with Catholic religion. So we are very deeply connected, attached to the uh, uh, strong state as a guardian of human rights because Poland uh, for uh, nearly 200 years was occupied by, by Russia, Prussia, and so on and so on, and the only strong state, strong state could, pro could protect the liberties and freedoms of Polish citizens. Yeah not the institution of ego and others. And in the political reality, Polish Republicanism defends also traditional family model, strongly opposed abortion, <coughs> And I repeat, it is just a part of our um, uh, of our tradition, yes, of our identity constitution. Somebody may, uh, uh, may be of the opinion we are a conservative. Yes, we are, yes. We are so educated. We are such a tradition, simply. It is our constitutional identity. Right? Besides, it should be strongly emphasized that the dispute between the government, the 
and the opposition fulfills the, cri the all criteria of democratic debate, since all political parties can freely express themselves and present their point of view. All kinds of media are allowed to present this debate and citizens express their conviction in numerous, in numerous um, demonstrations and protests. But it is a quite another matter that after this debate there are elections yes, and it may be said for our opponents that they lose constantly lose all important uh, elections in Poland, apart from few very referring to referendum in Warsaw. So I think I, I maybe I should. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to three very disputable facts about the Polish tribunal and society, but it would be very, very long debate, so maybe I limit only to some remarks, yes, to some lead. Firstly, I would, like, I would like to draw your attention to one important fact. Who does not take this fact into account cannot understand why the majority of, of Poles supports their government actions and considers them to be morally justified. The reforms implemented by the Polish government are made at fighting of all embracing corruption in Poland. The corruption with, uh, which ruins my country, the corruption in which are involved top politicians, top lawyers, judges, among other judges of Supreme Courts, of constitutional tribunals, maybe uh, are very strong uh, words, but we can give undisputable evidences referring to uh, this statement. Thirdly, I would like to stress the exceptionally unreliability uh, of the EU institution and the Council of Europe and of course, not mention the opinion of the Venice Commission in assessing the situation in Poland. I put your, own, your attention to only one fact. Professor Andrzej Zypliński, after many interrogations, that he was this a close friend of many members of the Venice Commission, and in particular of its president. I ask you, how is it that the Commission, with claims to neutrality and impartiality, delegates to Poland a group in over 100 experts, yes? Delegates to Poland, just colleagues of Professor Zeplinski. It is, in my eyes, it's simply a scandal. It is an absurd. How, how can we take seriously the opinion of that commission? Yes? Well, no, well, maybe it's the end of my... <laughs> okay. A bit emotional. <laughs> you certainly put a lot on the table for us to, <laughs> to discuss. Thank you so much. And, and could I particularly say it, what a blessing it is for us that you're, that you're speaking to us in English, which many of us in the room understand pretty well. And, and we, couldn't, that we couldn't have this window open for us without your, your willingness to do that. Thank you both for that. Yeah. Now,
Um, let me open up to questions. This point. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to make a general remark about constitutional in Poland, because it's true that not everyone, perhaps even the majority of people, don't know the general rules of the constitution. But the constitution as such, as a document, is a very important. You have mentioned the constitution of 3rd May, and this is basically the basis of identity of Polish people. Uh, this is one of, we celebrate it as one of two national holidays, um, apart from the Independence Day. So this is the significance of the Constitution. And you were quite dismissive of, of the Constitution as it is at this point. You said that it's, um, I'm, I'm not sure about the, correct, uh, the exact words, but you described it as a failure, as uh, too vague. Uh, whereas, um, in general, uh, the constitution to be encompassing and the basis of the legal system uh, should be somewhat vague so that all the rules uh, can be added to it. Uh, otherwise, it would be crippling and uh, you just can't put everything in the constitution, make it um, include all the possible <coughs> exceptions and situations. And uh, you said that uh, there is uh, the basis uh, that the, the action of uh, the government was legitimate because it has the public support. Uh, well, first of all, um, I, I mean, I completely accept the fact that uh, it has the majority, uh, but it doesn't have the constitutional majority. Uh, the uh, Polish parliament includes everyone uh, and uh, represents all the people. There are uh, procedures in place which make sure that all the people are heard, even those which are not in the majority, but who nevertheless <coughs> voted and have their representatives. And one of those procedures includes representing the constitutional majority instead of the simple majority. Uh, in ignoring it, uh, you are closing the possibility of debate, uh, the possibility of those people who uh, support your political opponents uh, to uh, say what they think about this situation. And um, this is a general statement, not, uh, not limited to this situation. But uh, in general situation in um, politics, uh, it is often said that uh, people uh, support this party, so whatever they do is right, uh, because the people think that they want it. However, uh, this was not part of the campaign. It was in no way mentioned before the elections. There was no referendum, no general call about uh, this decision. So it's really hard to say whether people, even those who voted for law and justice, actually support this decision. Thank you. So as I said now, you know, I, I'd like to stress the following fact, that all fora are open for all discussions, yes, for all people who want to express its viewpoint referring to the Polish Constitution. There is no censorship yes. In this sense, we fulfill the first element of the democratic debate. We don't censor, we, we, that is the uh, current government, <laughs> don't censor any, uh, <coughs> any voices and so on. But, but after all of this, it is a problem of democracy. People vote, and they vote as they vote, yes? They suffer, and as long as they will be supporting the current government, they take, the parliament takes such and such decision. It, it is a sad fact for the opposition, but as they have a majority of, uh, in the same, in the policy, they made the same thing, yes. They voted, and, they, and unfortunately, they don't took into account our, our voices, our uh, reservations, yes, that it is a bad situation, that they must count, that Maybe in the future they lose the power, and they lose it, and it is my problem. Thank you. Thank you.
there are a lot of people wanting to ask questions, so I'm going to ask everyone who's going to ask questions to make them very brief, and, and thank you to, to um, our professors for being brief and response as well. And there's one there. Marcin Maciek, University of Warsaw. Mr. Sokolowski, you started your speech with a sentence that you are going to present the position of the Polish government. And then, within your speech, you said, our opponents lost the election. And you used the name of the civic platform and the law and justice. And this is not only one place you presented this kind of views, also in Hungary, recently in Germany. I will, and in the same speech, you said that there, is, there are more than one interpretations of the constitutions. And as you know, our constitution says that judges must be apolitical. Is there any Republican interpretation of our constitution that may cover what you've just said? I, I said I, I don't recognize you as a judge of the Constitutional Tribunal, but I believe you recognize yourself as a judge, and the government recognizes you as a judge. Is there any interpretation of the Constitution that, this, that can cover this kind of presentation? <laughs> and and say, let me, let me finish. Or, to put it bluntly, whom do you represent here? The Constitutional Tribunal or the Polish government? Thanks. Both. Both. You know, we, we can uh, um, to live with the illusion that there are some apolitical, neutral judges, as your uh, president, Rzepliński. But it was not me, but your president, who called the press, who called the TV, and proclaimed, in my eyes, this uh, statute referring to the Constitutional Tribunal is unconstitutional. It's obviously unconstitutional. But, of course, the last one to, to belongs to the Constitutional Tribunal. We did so, like the President uh, Rzepliński proclaimed. I don't want to live with such a kind of um, uh, uh, neutral position, to be neutral in political matters. Of course, taking decision, it is a problem of my, uh, say, reputation, of my respect. I take in uh, uh, into account arguments of Palestine. Uh, I'm, I'm impartial in the sense that I, uh, contrary uh, to what uh, to the, to what the uh, opposition uh, suggests, I uh, saw uh, so many times. But I meet Professor uh, Mr. Kaczynski three times in my life. Only one time after my election. So, we are not servants of Mr. Kaczynski. I want to something contrary to what made your president. The steadily gust of the civic platform party. In, in Professor Murawski's paper, it, it's quite interesting that in, in the the neat summary of the two contesting positions, one presented as that of the Polish government and parliament and the other as the position of the, the opposition. There's one proposition that is in both, which is judges should not engage in political activity. Complete consensus on this point, but <laughs> difference perhaps in the uh, interpretation of it. Um, this here, and, and then you. Uh, Mark McGregor, University of New South Wales. Much of my question was already uh, said by Professor Machak, so I can keep it brief. You make, uh, Professor, a lot of reference to Republican tradition and also to Polish tradition. In the former, the ones that the Republican tradition has revived by Skinner, whom you mentioned, and Pettit, there's a lot of... The central stress is opposition to domination. And with that opposition, a call for various institutions of accountability. It's hard to, re and in your account of the Polish tradition, you frequently speak in the first person plural. Our tradition, the Polish tradition, is conservative, it opposes abortion, various other things. But you use the same uh, pronoun to speak of the opposition between 
your government, as you put it, and, and the opposition. These are two different wings. One is one portion of the population. There is a tradition for which we uh, means just the supporters of one political option, but it's not Polish, it's German, it's the Schmidtian tradition, which says everybody who is not of us, even if they're citizens of the country, even if they have different views from us, is not a citizen, a private citizen. You know, to our tradition belongs the extreme tolerance, yes. So, the current government is against homosexuals and so on and so on. But there are no prosecutions. No. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I give Professor Stilinski? No, 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 just, 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 just one thing. After hearing what Professor Obrowski has said, I have the impression that I lived in a quite different country. Really? Uh, so probably our perception of reality is quite different. Uh, and I must confess that I do not belong to this tradition. So, uh, so I would like to ask you, am, am I excluded? Uh, or I'm still a Polish citizen enjoying full rights and so, and, and so on. And uh, continuing the, the topic raised by Professor Marczak, I'm really very much surprised because uh, that uh, I now have the impression that you and other uh, judges of the Constitutional Court elected uh, in the last two years were just representing the government. Uh, and I'm very much concerned about that. Uh, because uh, I had some doubts as to that, and now that you, once you confess that we you represent the government, by the, by the same, not representing the government, but you it's say our, our government. Uh, so okay. my impression was Maybe. that you are just representing the government, and very much concerned. I would never, uh, never file any constitutional complaint uh, as long as you are judge of the constitutional court, because. I have zero confidence that uh, this complaint would be considered on neutral basis. Uh, that would be considered by the representatives of the government. I'm really very much concerned, really. No, no, no. You know, it is some illusion, as I said here, because the professor. Uh, Studnitsky represents this part of our society which uh, tries, and it's your right, yes, <coughs> to reinterpret, reinterpret Polish constitution in a liberal way. Yes? Can I, can and I, it is a problem, of course, but it's a problem of debates. It's not a problem that you, you are not a part of Polish society. You have the right to defend or even reinterpret Polish constitution in strict liberal way, tak? preferring the interest of businessmen, of pop intellect politicians and so on, like the vice president of, uh, of uh, 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 we're going to we, for, for, we, we must move on because there's so many more questions. I'm just fascinated by the idea of representation and to represent a, a position or a tradition, a particular viewpoint on life, um, in the sense of espousing that or adhering that to that viewpoint, is one thing. Being a representative of the government in institutional terms might be something quite different. And I wonder if there's a, an ambiguity in, in the idea of representing one of these contesting Certain traditions. Um, well, but, you, yes. um, um, you and then you and then. Oxford University and previously Jagiellonian University. Um, I would like to touch upon once again uh, your, um, your remark that the government enjoys the majority um, up to now. vote on majority of people in Poland and I'm very concerned with this argument uh, because as, as I see repeated very often and this argument is repeated very often every time any violation of the Constitution is presented as a possible option. And I agree that the government has majority. The president is elected by the same political party 
and you, you enjoy this majority vote. However, it was already repeated, the majority to have the constitution, the majority um, that decided the constitution is in place, is a qualified majority. And if we see now that this constitution is not treated seriously by the government, by referring to the majority that is much lower, that means that we don't need to have any referendum, we don't need to ask qualified majority of people to change their decision from the previous constitution. And, and just to make it very specific, uh, Professor uh, Kisbert Studnitsky referred to the very clear example that the publisher, the government, the ministry, refused to uh, publish the judgment of the constitutional court. You can agree with the judgment, you can disagree with it, but as a government, you cannot simply refuse to publish the judgment. Of course, you can try to use additional procedures to invalidate the judgment. You cannot simply refuse it just as a matter of discretion. There is no such discretion in the Constitution. And if you clearly read the text of the Constitution, you just see that it is a statement that the ministry publishes the judgment of the Constitution. And if the government was able to take this very clear text and somehow <coughs> ignore it, and then uh, if this logic was followed in relation to many other very technical uh, constitutional provisions, and if you refer to the constitution as an open text church, of course it is open text church in some extent, but at some extent it's quite clear, and still there was no um, weight given from the government to these provisions, and of course that's a question, as I see we will, we will probably debate for long hours, and the government of the peace has majority, probably we cannot do anything about that, but the problem that that creates, and this changes the culture, if the, state, if, if the citizens see that this government doesn't care about the constitution, even if it's very clear, maybe now peace is very happy that it can pursue every policy it can, but it will happen in the future that the citizens will know that if the government doesn't respect the constitution, why people should respect their own rules, their own uh, uh, the legislation, and so on and so forth. And I'm just interested whether you don't see here any potential of a problem for citizens knowing that the rule of law, the abiding of rules, is something very unclear and we can move the boundaries very, very far. So, uh, so I agree with you, but I would like uh, come back to, to, to I would like to come back to my first uh, uh, remark, but it is primarily political. War, simply saying, war. In this war, I agree. Not only the uh, opposition is guilty of many unlawful actions. I must admit, with certain sadness, that sometimes the representatives of the current government, of the party uh, law and order, and so on and so on, go contrary to the law. For but it's in both sides, attack and uh, Aggression, yes, we are, they are attacked in an unlawful way, and they answer in an unlawful way. It, it, is, it, it is pretty naive to, to they, they act contrary to the law, we will follow around because we will upset the politics, the current government will be upset. It is said for this reason, I am of opinion, that without political resolution and the good will of both sides, we never resolve this conflict, only by means of legal arguments, or by, worse, by means of legal texts, because both sides sometimes use sophisticated legal tricks, yes. So you, you said something of publication of art. Can I refuse? Prime Minister, can I refuse? If, you, if the act, the decision is unlawful in his eyes, 
if you say, uh, yeah, sorry. I never published art which was taken in the wrong composition. Never we will publish the judgment of the Constitutional Tribunal, which was not in the panel of 13 judges, only in panel 11 judges. It is null and void <coughs> judgment. Yes. We're, going to, we're going to run out of time, um, but I will ask the two people have already asked, and, and everyone else, there will be an opportunity after lunch for further discussion of these issues. So I'm, I'm afraid we'll be, be ex please be extremely oh, oh, brief, but sorry. we may have to stop with these two there. Right, uh, so question for um, Professor Gisbert Sudiki, if I may. Um, just, I'm, I'm not sure yet, uh, and it's pretty my failing, quite what the ground was in which the Constitutional Tribunal concluded the amending statute was unconstitutional. Sorry? Could I'm not quite clear on what ground the Constitutional Tribunal concluded the amending statute was unconstitutional. So is the premise, if it falls within Article 197, it would be constitutional, but we are, there's an argument as to whether it does fall within it or not. Um, could you, if you can clarify that for me, I would be, be helpful. First of all, the Tribunal made a distinction uh, uh, between the subject matter of the review the procedural basis of the review and constitutional standards of the review. Mm -hmm. And then the tribunal said that what is subject matter of the review cannot be simultaneously the procedural basis of the review. So the tribunal applied the constitutional standards, uh, the principle of the rule of law, uh, effectiveness and so on, to check the provisions of Mendic statute, but refused to use the pro, uh, those uh, the rules as a procedural basis for, for, for the review. So that was, I would say, uh, the, the essence of, of, the, of, of, this, of this judgment. Uh, I have a question to Professor Morawski. Uh, Maybe uh, I, I would like to answer your question. Is because it is a mistake, a mistake. Mm -hmm. Namely, contrary to what you say, that it is logically impossible to decide cases on the basis of the statute which is questioning proceeding, tribunal under presidency of Zeplinski has repeatedly, many times, ruled on the basis of statutes whose constitutionality was questioned, to mention. For instance, it was, it, it was a constitutional complaint that uh, the tribunal cannot issue judgments in panel of one judge, yes? Because in the, uh, the Polish Constitution states that the tribunal <laughs> takes this, the, uh, takes this by majority, yeah? decision by the majority. Who a real colleague, famous logician, Professor Tuleya, in panel of one judge, Uh, come to the decision that the act which state that tribunal can issue its decision in uh, uh, in panel of one judge is constitutional. I can mention a lot of subjects. So we don't have time for a lot. But can, can, so can I just ask you, Professor Gisbert Studnitsky, if you have an answer to that very briefly, and then we'll see if we can get this question. Did, did, you, did you want to say anything in response to that? No, no. no. Okay. okay, very briefly. So once again, a question to Professor Moravsky. Uh, my name is Michal Babakevich. I'm an advocate practicing in Warsaw, also in cases before the tribunal, constitutional tribunal. So maybe one day I will face you on that, uh, during the trial. So I want to I want to know a, a precise legal explanation of yourself uh, for for my question for my two short precise legal questions because uh, uh, as I understand uh, we lawyers accept the the rule of law of Polish constitution that the judgments of the constitutional court are binding 
and undisputable. And no one, there is no institution in the Polish uh, legal system that can inv in, uh, invalidate or or examine the judgment of the Constitutional Court. So the question one is, why the Polish government, if you say that you defend the Polish government, why the Polish government doesn't publish the judgments of the Constitutional Court? And if the judgments are published, like uh, the judgments from the December 2015, if they are published, why they are not respected? by the Polish government and the Polish president. Very, please, very briefly. So we come again to this, to this conclusion uh, that it is a war now in Poland between two, two different political options and legal uh, arguments play in this, uh, uh, unfortunately, Unfortunately, in this uh, uh, debate, the second round, the, the second round. So, okay, the, but there, there will so be the, the opportunity to continue the debate. I didn't one. find your, your answer, the legal answer. The legal answer. So, you are talking about the values, the tradition, the yeah, religion, well, well, but well, not well, about well. the law. So, it is, it is always ridiculous to say that the, the, you, you, you say about these things that in Article uh, uh, 190 um, is at, is, uh, states that the decision of consumers are final uh, yes. and uh, of universe, universally binding force, yes? Mm -hmm. The answer is very simple. You, you forgot to add that the binding interpretation of Polish constitution after a long debate was abolished. And the statement that the decision on the constitutional tribunal are by, universally binding in final refers only to the conformity or unconformity of a statute with constitution and uh, uh, international treaties. No less, no more. It is not me, but the Supreme, who repeatedly in some its decision says, we don't accept any interpretative guidelines, uh, guidelines in the operative parts of the statements of the judgment of constitutional tribunal because the binding interpretation has been abolished in Poland since years. A tribunal and operative part, uh, part of its decision, I repeat, can only put sentences referring to conformity or unconformity of the statutes with constitution, not to interpretation. It is that your Professor Garlitsky who said, well, we had in Poland two constitutions, one from 1997 and the second one created by uh, constitutional tribunal. Yes, yes. And the second one is, is more important, yeah. important. Yeah. Oh, we're going to stop. Uh, let's thank Professor Morawski and Professor Gisbert Studinski for not just telling us about, but demonstrating to us the, what's going on in Poland. Thank you. <laughs>